What ambition has always meant to me is sort of being obsessively um, occupied with doing really well at whatever I am doing. And doing well to me means satisfying my own curiosity about um, how much I can achieve with whatever's in front of me. Um, so I'm ambitious in that sense. Uh, and the kind of time element to it for me of reflecting on my life, I guess, is I think, um, you know, I, I came from a very sort of, you know, a, a girls' school, high achieving, you know, clever girl thing. So whatever was put in front of me at school, I wanted to do really well at. And in the, in the sort of social context, you know, always imagined that that would be some sort of career but not so many role models out there so I just continued with the approach of you know having to be very very good at whatever I was doing in a good girl kind of way um, and it wasn't until later um, you know possibly even in the last 10 years I've reflected on being um, more conscious of what I am working towards whether it's what I really want to be devoting my incredible energy um, and um, obsession to, or whether it's just literally what is in front of me at the time. Um, um, an objective look at what I want to be ambitious about and devoting my energy to what I is actually going to reward me um, rather than just having to be, you know, ambitious or whatever was, was in front of me. Uh, I think what I undervalued when I was younger was the need for mentoring and support and the incredible value of networks and helping you achieve your ambition. And also re reading your book and reflecting on, you know, entrepreneurship in New Zealand. Um, and possibly it was also part of being, you know, a young woman in the 80s when, you know, you just, you, you were thrown into the pond and you just did your best and you did what you could, but there wasn't much around you to support you. Um, you know, and I never felt discriminated against or anything, although looking back, I was definitely, but you know, I just kind of kept going with what I was doing. Um, as again, as I've got older, I've reflected on the, you know, the incredible power that you have by working with other people um, to achieve joint ambition when your ambitions are aligned with others. Um, and yeah, I think that, that that has changed my view of what um, helps me achieve my ambitions and possibly also what my ambitions are because I'm more influenced by you know other people's perspectives too which helps me refine what, what I want to achieve. So, what well, do you think that you, you've described a, a real drive or a you know desire to do yeah. to do it where, where do you think that came from? I think it's it's my personality um, and I think really you know driven and I'm not ambitious, I'm not ambitious for any, you know, I like to earn money and things, but it's, you know, that's a byproduct in a way. Um, it's, it's personal curiosity, really, you know, just what do I need to know? What about this? How can I solve this problem? That's a big driver for me as well. Um, seeing problems everywhere and thinking, oh, that could be done differently or how would you do this? And just intellectual curiosity, I suppose, partly, you might describe it. Um, yeah, and, and again, putting it in a context, for me, it's all about um, what you want to achieve with your ambition. Um, I think some of the models of ambition, um, particularly, you know, with, without I'm not trying to be too sort of, are uh, very six, externally success-driven recognition, money, power, that type of driver of ambition, that model of ambition just doesn't appeal to me. Um, that wasn't, that isn't what motivates me. Um, so when you, you, you've traveled, right? You've lived in New Zealand, you've lived away. Mm. Did you notice your ambition changing based on where you were like physically in the world at the time? Um, what I was pointing my ambition towards changed because partly because my um, moves, and I suppose this is the case for most people, were driven by you know, and when I worked for Foreign Affairs for my, by my employer and by my um, roles. Um, but I think that growing recognition of the power of networks and collaboration and achieving your ambitions was something that really um, was developed for me by living and working overseas, being exposed to different ways of thinking, how to figure out how to collaborate with different kinds of people. You know, it's mind expanding in many ways and that affects both how you achieve your ambitions and what your ambitions are, um, to my mind. It's also interesting for me to reflect too on the places where I 
lived and worked overseas, which weren't North America. Again, looking at those models of entrepreneurship and ambition. Um, in Asia, I uh, developed a very good understanding of you know consensus decision making and again that power of networks and collaboration uh, you know because there's very uh, in, in business you know the overseas chinese networks and and those sorts of ways of doing things and how ambition is achieved in a in a joint way in a communal way um was very instructive for me so yeah definitely it influenced um, my thinking about what i wanted to achieve in life and have you carried that with you? I mean, did yeah, you adapt? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I think my, you know, my personality now, whether you're talking about ambition or anything, is completely layered by my experiences overseas um, in every country and in every setting that I worked in. Um, and some of those were very complex. You know, when I worked at the AP Secretariat, I was in a team of 21 different nationalities. So there was no norm. Um, mm -hmm you know, yeah, it was, it was a completely mind-blowing um, interpersonal experience. So if I were to ask you um, to describe the most ambitious person that you know, mm -hmm. what, what would come to your mind? Yeah, do you know when I looked at your question on this, the person that immediately came to mind for me was Jacinda Ardern. Um, mm -hmm. And I think she is ambitious in the sense that the two examples that sprang to mind immediately for me were um, the Christchurch um, mosque shootings. She was incredibly ambitious for the way that New Zealand would respond to that. It would have been very easy, not that I think we would have ever defaulted to a xenophobic mode, but to uh, blaming the, the shooter because he was an Australian, talking about the vulnerability of the Muslim community, putting it in a wider international context of terrorism. But in fact, what she did, she was ambitious for the best parts of the New Zealand identity, which is that, you know, kaitiaki of people, you know, looking after each other, being collaborative, being, um, you know, a, 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 a joined up nation of five million people, which, you know, is not always true. It's not always accurate, but that I think is really what very many New Zealanders would see our country as being. Um, and perhaps even more resonant to people who've lived overseas. Because I think when you look back, when you're living in a big you know, international city, you look back and you think, wow, you know, everybody knows each other, care about each other. <laughs> it's a romantic idea of New Zealand. And she, you know, stood up and said my, I wouldn't say it's as boldly as this, but you know, her action and her words said, this is how I am leading our country to respond to this terrible thing that's happened. Uh, and secondly, with COVID, she, was, she has been the most ambitious world leader you know, granted, we have very ideal circumstances to aim for elimination and that we're an island. <laughs> but, you know, she has been the most ambitious world leader in, um, in attacking COVID and aiming for elimination. Um, and I suppose my view of her as being ambitious lies with that idea of always, my personal values of always wanting to, you know, do the best job and it not necessarily being about recognition and about it's about you know doing what you think uh, personally is the right thing and in her case you know was what she felt was the right thing for for the country yeah i wonder if there's a gender element there mm. yeah although i'm a little bit wary of doing that because i mean there's the traditional view that women are more kind of empathetic and compassionate and all that sort of stuff but in fact i think in this instance the the other leaders <laughs> other world leaders, they weren't ambitious enough about what, how, you know, what their country people could achieve and what the, you know, she was in a coalition government. She was not at all in a stable political situation. There are other countries which have much, where the leaders have much greater majorities, yet they were less willing to bite the bullet. And I'm not talking about the UEC because that's a particular example. Um, you yeah, know, even in Australia, you know, it's a federal system, so that does have some complications. But um, yeah, I I would see her as um, ambitious in a, in a very um, concrete and high-reaching um, way. In the same way that Trump is ambitious to make America great again, or to um, or to uh, you know remove dependence on perceived perceived uh, dependence on the Chinese economy, um, I think her level of ambition is, is, is of equal magnitude. 
Do you, do you think um, that in the time that you've lived in New Zealand and the time that you've been away and the time that you've come back, how ambition is kind of perceived and discussed in the country has changed at all or has it, yeah, has it been relatively consistent? Yeah, I think um, ambition is far more acceptable now. You know, interestingly, again, reading your book and that tall poppy um, syndrome, you know, I just give you a yeah, just contrast two examples. We, we do some work for the Reserve Bank and um, some flowers appeared the other day from the governor saying thank you because we looked after one of their senior appointments and, and um, they had been really happy with what we'd done. And I showed my mother, who's 85, and she said to me, oh, we're not big boasters in our family, are we? <laughs> so this was, this was, you know, my generation being brought up. Um, you know, we know, sort of, she's, yeah, as I say, she's 85, so that was the attitude then. Now, I feel a lot more supported in my ambition generally. Um, you know, if I achieve something on, you know, we've just been uh, put, we've reached the finals of two industry awards and, you know, put a little post up on LinkedIn and all of the people I work with and our clients and, and you know, everybody's congratulating you. There's no shame in doing that. In fact, people are celebrating each other's success. So I think that's really positive. Um, and to me personally, it makes a big um, difference with being ambitious uh, because I do feel that, um, yeah, that we, you know, perhaps it was due to my upbringing or whatever, or the, my age, you know, there was, you did have, to, I remember at foreign affairs actually male senior people to me saying oh you're quite ambitious you know and a bit of a like I don't really like and that it wasn't a compliment no no yeah, yeah. <laughs> um whereas now it's it's yeah I think it's a lot more acceptable when you know I see that with my my daughter who's 20. Um, I think a lot of New Zealand ambition is not necessarily driven by um external recognition and money and that side of things uh, but people are recognising that it's okay to be ambitious now. Exactly. And I think the other thing that I feel has changed in relation to me, but I, and I think it's a broader acceptance in society, is that um, the whole focus on failure as part of ambition, um, you know, that you can have failures along the way and that is a pathway to success and to sort of trust that what you're ambition, what you really want to achieve is a valid thing, even if other people are telling you that it's not. You just have to find the network who um, thinks or aligns with you or sees value in what you're thinking um, and, and then go ahead. Uh, and that removes some of that, um, those sort of old definitions of ambition as being all about money. You know, you, you we all have friends who've been very successful in their careers but incredibly unhappy with what they're doing because they've been ambitious to get money but that wasn't actually what was really driving them or what they wanted. So I guess it's matching up your sort of values, the right people around you and your ambition. Uh, and to me that's kind of the magic package and I think people are becoming a bit more conscious of those things having to go together. You know, I have become more ambitious with age, definitely. Mm -hmm even though I'm not saying I mean, I've always been ambitious, but uh, I, and it may, it may also be reflective of a woman of my age group because I, you know, we had a pretty full on career and then I stepped out of my career and focused on my children for a few years. So, and I kind of always wanted to do a very good job as a parent, but I let my personal ambitions go. And then in the last 10 years, I've thought, well, five years, I guess, um, I've thought, well, actually, no, I still have some things left to do in my life. So I certainly, and I was interested in reading your book on this subject, you know, I haven't got to the point where, you know, I've got my boat and my car and my batch and I'm dialing down the ambition. It's almost the other way around. I sort of feel more focused and um, supported uh, than ever. I, I do wonder whether it's a generational thing too, because I think my generation was still in that in-between thing where it wasn't that easy or socially acceptable to have a really full-on career and to have children. And that, and that was my self-limiting belief. I'm not saying that everybody mm -hmm. believed that. Whereas now I think it is a lot more doable, a lot more possible. Employers are supportive of it. Um, workplace structures, remote working supports it. Um, so that I, the ability to, to have more of a, 
a linear career path, if you want to call it that, um, mm. is, is there. So maybe it's an anomaly. I don't know. Yeah, it would be interesting to talk to some millennial woman about this mm. or, or even in their 30s, because I do get the sense that they're also more demanding <laughs> of mm -hmm. um, their, I mean, well, I mean, the, the, the research and literature suggests that generation, and I certainly hear it from my friends who are senior in organisations in New Zealand, they're more demanding generally. And I mm. suspect that that demand for actual career and actual parenting and figuring out how mm -hmm. to do it Will, can, will, will come out of that generation. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with you, you know, women of my age or, or slightly younger, you know, they're, they're, they're being kind of ripped off by, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. by having this dual thing going on. But I'm not sure that the younger generation is actually going to put up with that <laughs> based on right. their plans around, um, you know, or just so much of their, their um, attitude in the workforce. Uh, about work-life balance and what they're prepared and what they're not prepared to do and their, um, you know, demands for interesting work early on and all of that, um, that, that sort of... Yeah, thing. and then when your Prime Minister accidentally gets pregnant and says, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm taking maternity leave. I mean, just the, the yeah. visual of that. Exactly. Just the, you know, the sense of her, huh, you know? Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah.